Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the final speaker of tonight, uh, Dr. Paul Kangor. Uh, Paul Kangor is a professor of political science here at Grove City College in Grove City, Pennsylvania, and is a New York Times bestselling author of over 20 books. He's the senior director and chief academic fellow at the Institute for Faith and Freedom, and is a former visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. His articles have appeared in publications from the Washington Post, USA Today, to the Wall Street Journal, and New York Times. He's a longtime columnist for the American Spectator, where he was named editor-in-chief of the magazine in September 20, 2022 to succeed founder R. Emmett Terrell, Jr. He is an internationally recognized authority on several subjects, particularly Ronald Reagan, the Cold War, and communism. and the American presidency. Sorry about that. <laughs> Dr. Kangor received his doctorate from the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public and International Affairs and his master's degree from the American University School of International Service. He holds an honorary doctorate from Franciscan University. And lastly, he and his wife, Susan, have eight children, two of which are adopted. And above all, our favorite professor. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Kangor. Thank you, Corey. He's a great student, and, uh, and this whole group of student fellows this year, they're just terrific. I mean, you all just got to see uh, Grace and, and Katie and Lauren up there on stage, and we, we've just really been blessed. I mean, we have, um, Robert, how many student fellows do we have this year? I think we have close to 20. And in a typical year, it will take about 12. But, but for this past year, we were looking at the crop, and we said, well, we gotta, we gotta like double this. I mean, we, you know, who, we, who are we gonna turn down? So we had just um, such a great class, and, and it's really going to be sad when, when a number of them leave and graduate. Probably not for them, right? They'll be, <laughs> but, uh, but no, they'll, they'll miss the place. They will, for sure. And you know, Corey's graduating, Grace is graduating, Isaac Willauer is graduating, uh, Ben Chamberlain. I could go on down the list, so, so, they're, so they're really going to be missed. But, uh, but, but thank you all for coming, and this has been just, uh, just an amazing conference. We did, uh, we did just one day this, this year, rather than two days, and Robert and I were wondering if it would be, if it'd be too short, but we, I, I feel it was good. I feel it was, it was sufficient, so we really got to hear, hear some great speakers. So wrapping up, with this, uh, the final talk is, um, maybe it's a little bit out of sequence, but I don't know totally. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to focus on the founding of the modern nation of Israel, and the date for that was May 1948, and I'm going to focus specifically on FDR, so Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was president 1933 to 45, and Harry Truman, who was president from 1945 to 53. And, and so it was Truman, above all, that with, without Truman, it's hard to imagine the United States supporting the creation of the modern nation of Israel, and maybe even, even it happening altogether. All so I'll start with FDR, and I'll start with a quote from David Niles. Now, Niles was a really complex figure. Um, he was, he was an, a special aide to Harry Truman. He was, uh, he was Zionist, he was Jewish, pro-Zionist, pro-Israel. He's also pro-communist, which I won't get into, but uh, it was just, a, just kind of a, a quirky guy, but, but it was certainly right on Israel. And he said this, there are serious doubts in my mind that Israel would have come into being if Franklin Roosevelt had lived. Now, that's quite a statement, I'll repeat it. There are serious doubts in my mind that Israel would have come into being if, Israel, if, if, uh, if, Ru if Franklin Roosevelt had lived. So Roosevelt, as I said, he came in in 1933. So he was elected to, to four terms altogether. So first came in 1933, and then 1945, died in April 1945. And at that point, he was just starting into his fourth term. And at that point, we didn't have presidential term limits yet. Right? There was an understanding, kind of a gentleman's agreement going back to George Washington that you would serve two terms and then retire to Mount Vernon or wherever you would retire to. But, uh, but FDR went for and, and, and won a fourth term. FDR, though he is a liberal icon, was um, very racially and ethnically um, insensitive, let's put it that way. And, 
It's kind of amazing how the liberals let their own get away with this stuff, right? Uh, Margaret Sanger, um, people on the far left, um, you know, Karl Marx, uh, it, it, the things that FDR said about, as he called them, Asiatics, um, Africans, which was generally his word, um, his, his generalization for black Americans as well, and of course the internment of the Japanese. I mean, could you imagine if a Republican president had done that? I mean, it'd be forever infamous, and yet FDR in every single presidential poll, probably from here to eternity, as long as um, liberals dominate academia, is going to get ranked the third greatest president of all time, behind only Washington and Lincoln. I mean, you can imagine if, like, you know, Donald Trump or Ronald Reagan or Calvin Coolidge had interned the Japanese, right? But, uh, but, but FDR gets away with it. Also, so these ethnic prejudices also applied to very much what in his case was anti-Semitism. And I'll give you some examples of that in a minute. First example of kind of um, Roosevelt not doing you know, exactly real good with uh, the plight of Jews under Hitler. May 1939, May 13th, 1939. And this is from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is my source. I'll read directly from it. On May 13, 1939, the German transatlantic liner, the St. Louis, some of you know what I'm talking about, right? You're nodding already. Sailed from Hamburg, Germany to Havana, Cuba. Now that's long before Castro, so Batista's in charge at that point. Cuba is a close U.S. ally. On the voyage were 938 passengers, one of whom was not a refugee. Almost all were Jews fleeing from the Third Reich. Most were German citizens, some were from Eastern Europe, and a few were officially stateless. The majority of the Jewish passengers had applied for U.S. visas. Now again, May 1939. This is when the Holocaust is really taking off, right? And at that point, you know, Hitler is, uh, in the next year, will invade France. He will, uh, Hitler-Stalin pact comes up in, in August 1930. This is really the cost of the start of, pretty much the start of World War II. But, but Hitler's great solution, as he called it, a final solution toward the Jews is already going on. People are already being put in concentration camps. The majority of the Jewish, Jewish passengers had applied for U.S. visas and had planned to stay in Cuba only until they could enter the United States. The voyage of the St. Louis attracted a great deal of media attention. Even before the ship sailed for, from Hamburg, Cuban newspapers deplored its impending arrival and demanded that the Cuban government cease admitting Jewish refugees. As for the United States, sailing so close to Florida that they could see the lights of Miami, some passengers on the St. Louis cabled Franklin D. Roosevelt personally asking for refuge. Roosevelt never responded. Never responded. Got as close as the lights of Miami. Following the U.S. government's refusal to permit the passengers to disembark, the St. Louis sailed back to Europe on June 6, 1939. In the end of these passengers, 278 survived the Holocaust. 254 of them died. So sent back sent back to Europe. Moving later into the war, now this would be 1943, May 1943, and this is an article from Raphael Madoff, who is, um, he's writing for the Los Angeles Times, and he's written the book, uh, The Jews Should Keep Quiet, about FDR and the Holocaust, which is a quote from FDR. In May 1943, President Franklin Roosevelt met with British Prime Minister Winston Churchill at the White House. It was 17 months after Pearl Harbor and a little more than a year before D-Day. The two Allied leaders reviewed the war effort to date and exchanged thoughts on their plans for the post-war era. So May 1943. The war ends in Europe in May 1945 when, uh, when Hitler shot himself, so VE Day. So this is, but already in May 1943. It looks like hopefully we're probably going to win. So they're already starting to hold conferences, Casablanca, Tehran. Later, Yalta, Potsdam. So this is Casablanca. Uh, at one point in the conversation, FDR offered what he called, quote, the best way to settle the Jewish question. So what are they going to do with these Jews, the ones that, have, that presumably survive the concentration camps? Auschwitz, Treblinka, right? 
Vice President Henry Wallace, who noted the conversation in his diary, said Roosevelt spoke approvingly of a plan, which was recommended by uh, Johns Hopkins University President Isaiah Bowman. A lot of this, this is known as the M Project, if any of you are familiar with this. It's just now starting to get attention from scholars. Vice President Henry Wallace said Roosevelt spoke approvingly of a plan, quote, to spread the Jews thin all over the world. That was the FDR plan, spread the Jews thin all over the world. Not put them in the nation state of Israel. Now, by the way, I should give a little bit of background on this. Theodore Herzl had written his book on a Jewish state, a Jewish nation state, way back in the late 1800s, turn of the century. And already, the Balfour Declaration, the Brits, even Woodrow Wilson, Calvin Coolidge, the 19 presidents, 1920s presidents, they were on board for, for supporting the creation of nation of Israel and Palestine. So FDR is a complete anomaly here. The diary entry adds this. The president, Roosevelt, said he had tried this approach, thin the Jews out, in Meriwether County, Georgia, where Roosevelt had lived in the 1920s and at Hyde Park, and on the basis of adding four or five Jewish families at each place. He claimed that the local population would have no objection if there were no more than that. Let's put a few Jews here, a few Jews there, a few over here. Roosevelt's best way remark, writes Raphael Medoff, is condescending and distasteful, and coming from anybody else, it probably would be regarded as anti-Semitism. But more than that, FDR's support for spreading the Jews thin may hold the key to understanding a subject that has been at the center of controversy for decades, namely, the American government's tepid response to the Holocaust, and that would be the FDR administration's tepid response to the Holocaust, because that's all going on while FDR is president. Here's the paradox. The US immigration system in the 1930s under FDR severely limited the number of German Jews admitted to the United States during the Nazi era to, you guys ready for this? 26,000 annually, that's it. 26,000 German Jews allowed into the United States annually during the, during the Hitler era, capped, right? They needed Joe Biden, an open border, <laughs> right? But seriously, this is in 26,000, that's it per year? It's 10 million Jews in the world at that time. And Hitler's gonna kill six million of them. But even that quota was less than 25% filled during most of the Hitler era because the Roosevelt administration piled on so many extra requirements for would-be immigrants. For example, starting in 1941, merely leaving behind a close relative in Europe would be enough to disqualify an applicant. On the absurd assumption that the Nazis could threaten the relative and thereby force the immigrant into spying for Hitler. Now, of course, a lot of this is why FDR did what we did with the Japanese as well. Didn't know that they could be trusted, that they could be loyal, Japanese Americans. Why did the administration actively seek to discourage and disqualify Jewish ref refugees from coming to the United States? Why didn't the president quietly tell his State Department, which administered the immigration system, to fill the quotas for Germany and Axis occupied countries to at least the legal limit? That alone could have saved 190,000 lives by the way, which is a drop in the bucket. They should have been trying to get 1.9 million lives. Uh, and, and other background to this, the late great historian Paul Johnson refers to Exodus 1 and Exodus 2 in his book on the history of the Jews. And Exodus 2 is the period in the 1800s when massive numbers of Jewish immigrants came to the United States. In fact, Rabbi David Lapin, uh, Daniel Lapin in California says that he is convinced that the Jewish people would cease to exist had it, not be, had it not been for America and Ellis Island. Because so many of them, were, I mean, there are more Jews in New York City than Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, probably to this day. So they, they, they came at one point, and now all of a sudden, it's just being stopped. It would not have required a fight with Congress or the anti-immigration forces. It would have involved minimal political risk to the president. Every, uh, every president's policy decisions are shaped by a variety of factors. Here again, I'm quoting Raphael Medoff. Some political, some personal. In Roosevelt's case, a pattern of private remarks about Jews 
some of which have only recently been discovered by the central Zionist archives in Jerusalem and from other sources, may be significant. You bet it is. It's very significant. In 1923, as a member of the Harvard Board of Directors, so he would have been not even uh, governor of New York at that point, FDR decided that there were too many Jewish students at the college and helped institute a quota to limit the number admitted. By the way, I'm writing a book right now on Ronald Reagan and race. It's the longest book I've ever written. And it's being written because I got to defend Reagan for one comment he made at Nixon in 1971. All right? You know, Reagan at Eureka College in the 1920s, which was an abolitionist college, all of his, all of his best friends were black. Right? It's a, this is the kind of thing that they, they, they kill somebody on our side for, but someone like FDR can get away with this. In 1938, FDR privately suggested that Jews in Poland were dominating the economy and therefore were to blame for provoking anti-Semitism there. In 1941, he remarked at a cabinet meeting that there were too many Jews among federal employees in Oregon. Is he sitting around counting? Huh. In 1943, he told government officials in allied liberated North Africa that the number of local Jews in various professions quote, should be definitely limited, unquote, so as to, quote, eliminate the specific and understandable complaints which, which the Germans bore toward the Jews in Germany, unquote. Think about that. There is evidence of other troubling remarks by FDR, too, including dismissing pleas for Jewish refugees as Jewish wailing and sob stuff expressing to a senator his pride that, quote, there is no Jewish blood in our veins, and characterizing a tax maneuver by a Jewish newspaper publisher as a, quote, dirty Jewish trick, unquote. But the most common theme in Roosevelt's private statements about Jews has to do with his perception that they were overcrowding many professions and exercising undue influence. I'll give you another example of that. So he said this at Casablanca in 1943. The number of Jews engaged in the practice of the professions, law, medicine, etc., should be definitely limited to the percentage that the Jewish population in North Africa bears to the whole North African population. The plan would be to further eliminate the specific and understandable complaints, this is what I said before, I quoted before, about the Germans bore toward the, Jew, uh, toward the Jews in Germany, namely that while they represent a small part of the German population, over 50% of the lawyers, doctors, school teachers, and college professors in Germany were Jews. By the way, as Medoff notes, uh, the statistics that he's citing there are false. No one knows where he's really getting, getting those numbers. I have here, um, this is a document, and in, in my Middle East course, I actually photocopy it, send it around to students, and I could give any of you a copy if you, if you need to see it. I've got extras, extras here. Uh, Stan Evans and Herb Romerstein, who were both good friends of mine, did a book called Stalin's Secret Agents. And um, in fact, Herb died when the book was being finished. Stan had to finish the book. And Stan went to the University of Virginia and visited the Edward Statinius papers at the University of Virginia. Statinius was the Secretary of State for FDR. And, and he found this document, and it's just sitting there in the archives, and these scholars do nothing with it. It's February 10th, 1945. It says, top secret. Anyone know what conference was going on February 10th, 1945? Yalta, all right, all right. Which was just an abomination in, in so many ways, right? We know about what happened with Eastern Europe and the Iron Curtain. But this, no one ever talks about. So these are notes from Statinius's papers. Marshal Stalin, so at the big three at Yalta are Stalin, who else? Churchill and FDR. Marshal Stalin said that he thought more time was needed to consider and finish the business of the conference. The president, FDR, answered that he had three kings waiting for him in the Near East, including King Saud. Marshal Stalin, once, uh, Marshal Stalin asked whether the president intended to make any concessions to Saud. The president replied that there was only one concession that he might offer to the Saudi king, and that was to give him the six million Jews in the United States. Yeah, 
Yeah. Give him the six million Jews in the United States. I talked to Stan Evans about this. And um, in fact, Stan, I'll never forget, when his book came out, he took it on the Glenn Beck program on Fox News Channel, but back when Glenn Beck had that really big show, it was, was very influential. And I said to him, I, I said, okay, look, I mean, you know, I don't like FDR either, but I, I mean, what do, you, what do you make of that? I said, do you think maybe he was joking? Right? And so I wrote down Stan's response. Who knows? Who knows what he meant? He said he, he did note that um, FDR was physically and mentally declining at that point and would die about two months later after coming back from Yalta. But either way, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's quite a statement, right? Give him the six million Jews in the United States. Now, I don't think that would have gone anywhere, but uh, you know, his idea of this was not exactly a pro-Jewish president. I'll note this before I get to, get to Harry Truman. Uh, so big three at Yalta and these other places again, so uh, FDR, Churchill, and Stalin. What about Stalin and, and Israel? during this time. Well, quite interestingly, the Soviets actually supported a, 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 an Israeli state in Palestine. Stalin was, Stalin was actually supportive of this. And it's kind of odd because Stalin was certainly anti-religious, um, you know, anti-Christian, anti-Semitic. Anti but the reasons that he did this, uh, it's, Paul Johnson said it's complicated. I don't know how complicated it is. I'll give you a few reasons. One, strategic reasons in the Cold War. So at the time, the Soviets badly wanted a satellite state somewhere in the Mediterranean. All right, they wanted Italy. They wanted Greece. They wanted Turkey. They wanted Israel. Um, Italy at that time, the first major CIA operation when the CIA was created in the National Security Act of June 1947 was to try to influence the Italian elections in 1948 to make sure the Italians didn't elect communists. Um, Pope Pius XII threatened to excommunicate any Italian who voted, any Italian Catholic who, who voted for the communists. Um, my grandparents, I remember saying uh, that, that they, relatives had had uh, had had uh, they had sent letters to relatives back in Italy telling them not to vote for the communists. They don't get Italy, the communist loss. So then Truman focuses on with the Truman Doctrine, which two countries? Greece and Turkey, because Greece and Turkey had the ability to possibly go communist. We stopped it. They didn't get either one of those. That's 1947. So the Soviets are thinking, Israel, well, you know, the United States, FDR didn't take a big stand on them. David Ben-Gurion was pro-Bolshevik at one point. The Israeli leadership at that time was very far left, um, even to some extent pro-communist. So, so you know, let's put our chips here with Israel. Let's be kind to Israel. Maybe they could become an ally. Maybe they could become a, you know, possibly a base of Soviet operations. So that's one reason. Uh, Michael Oren, who is a great historian for, um, and a uh, great Jewish historian, also Israeli ambassador, he adds that the USSR, quote, supported the creation of Israel because it split the British Empire in the Middle East, right in half. So in 1940, Britain had its largest base in the world in the Suez Canal at that time. Britain was in Jordan, Egypt, Iraq, Persian Gulf. So for all those reasons, the Soviets, Michael Oren argued, had, had anti-British reasons. So, so you know, those are all possible reasons why Stalin did what he did. Who was the leader of Israel in the 1973 war? Golda Meir. Golda Meir. She was... Um, she was actually Israel's first ambassador to Moscow. And she said this about the Soviets in 1948. No matter how radically Soviet relations with us changed in the last 25 years, so she's looking back in retrospect, I cannot forget the picture at that time. Who knew if we could have survived the early dark days of the war? So May 1948, the minute that Israel becomes a state at 12.01 a.m., the Arabs invade from every single front, right? From, from the south, from the north, from the east, all of them, right? Syria, Jordan, Egypt, Lebanon, Iraq, every Jews who had once been in 
concentration camps and they came out as displaced persons were in bunkers, just like that, all over again. So they're desperate. Golda Meir, in these dark days of the war, we could not have survived without the military equipment that we bought in Czechoslovakia and transported through Yugoslavia and other Balkan countries. These were the communist countries. In the first six weeks of the war, we relied on mortar shells, machine guns, and bullets, which Haganah managed to buy in Eastern Europe in the face of a US arms embargo. Though, of course, we did not rely on this alone. We cannot erase the past because it doesn't look like, like the present. But a fact remains a fact. No matter how sharply the Soviet Union turned against us subsequently, Soviet recognition of Israel on May 18th had enormous significance. It meant that the two leading world powers after the war had agreed to, agreed to support a Jewish nation. Now, at that point, FDR had been dead for three years and Truman as president. Meyer added, the recognition of Israel by the, US follow, by, by the USSR, followed by that of America, has different sources. Today, I have no doubt that for the Soviets, recognition was part of a strategy to drive Britain from the Middle East. All right. So FDR died in April 1945, died of a um, cerebral hemorrhage. It was uh, very unexpected. Right? The country was, uh, was completely shocked by that. If you ever see any pictures from, from Yalta, uh, in fact, that chapter in, in Herb Romerstein and Staten Evans' book is called The Ghost Ship at Yalta. Uh, FDR looks like a ghost. I mean, he's, he's not in good shape, and he looks very sick. Uh, Stalin, they believe, exacerbated his illness by, by having it where, where he did. So he came back and, and only, only lived a few more weeks. And Harry Truman, in his first press conference after FDR died, told the press that Truman had been a farmer. He said, gentlemen, I don't know if you ever got hit by a bale of hay before, but I'll tell you how I feel. I feel like I got hit by a bale of hay and the moon and the stars and everything else just fell on me. And he said, uh, gentlemen, if you're praying men, pray for me, right? Because I, because I don't know how I'm going to do this. So he ends up being the president to uh, end the war in Europe a few weeks later. And then the president of Potsdam, who ends the war in Japan, dro drops the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I think Truman was probably, Truman was famous for the statement, the buck stops here, right? I, I, probably the best pure decision maker we might have ever had. I mean, that guy had to make some hard decisions. The Oppenheimer movie, as some of you probably saw, the Oppenheimer movie recently. Truman also had to make the decision to get the hydrogen bomb, to pursue the hydrogen bomb. Truman Doctrine, Marshall Plan, on and on and on and on. By the way, if Henry Wallace, if FDR had died when Henry Wallace was vice president instead of Harry Truman, that would have been a disaster for, for the world. So Truman, by 1947-48, uh, the UN is up and running in 1947. They developed a UN partition plan for Palestine, November 29, 1947. So this is UN General, Assembl UN General Assembly Resolution 181. And the United States had to decide whether or not to support this. Truman wholeheartedly supported it, the creation of a nation state of Israel in Palestine for the Jewish people. Who disagrees with him? Almost all of the US delegation to the UN. George C. Marshall and the State Department. James Forrestal and the, the newly created Department of Defense. This is the first time the United States had a, had a wartime, non-wartime, we had a Department of Defense, newly created in 1947. FDR, of course, had been against it, many other people. However, Truman supports it. He cites uh, three chief reasons here, and I'll go through these. One, the Holocaust and the fact that, in his view, Jews needed a safe place, as he called it, a safe haven, so humanitarian. Two, religious. He believed that he was following what the scriptures said he should do, biblical even. And three, he said plainly, it's just the right thing to do. David McCullough, who was the Truman biographer, wasn't David McCullough a great historian? He's, he's from, from Pittsburgh originally, and he, he did, uh, hosted the American Experience on PBS for the, for the longest time. Died, I think, just in the last couple of years. Did, uh, did the John Adams work, uh, Thomas Jefferson, the 1776 book. 
um, wrote on the Brooklyn Bridge, Johnstown Flood, did the best book on Harry Truman. I strongly recommend it. McCullough said this, you have to understand that for Harry Truman, Palestine, which is what that area had been called for centuries before that, was never just a place on a map. So it wasn't just about territory. Clark Clifford, who became a Secretary of Defense under JFK, under LBJ, been around for, for many years. By the way, Clark Clifford, I have a Reagan story for everything. Clark Clifford was the one who called Reagan an amiable dunce. That's Clark Clifford's quote, right? But, uh, but, but Clifford, who was there, Clifford and David Niles were probably two of the only pro-Zionist aides that Truman had. And he said this, Harry Truman's own reading of ancient history in the Bible made him a supporter of the idea of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, even when others who were sympathetic to the plight of the Jews were talking of sending them to places like Brazil. That was another idea. Eh, just send them to Brazil, right? I mean, come on, weather's great in Brazil. Who could complain about Brazil? One of the biggest countries out there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that's it's a very good point. Yeah, uh, but you could probably fit 20 Israels in uh, Brazil, at least. I mean, Israel is just this tiny little, tiny little country. But yeah, a lot of people said, just send them to Brazil. And Truman said, you can't do that. I mean, the, the Jewish homeland is in Palestine. That's where Jerusalem is. It's where all these sites are. You can't just put them to Brazil. But to some people, like Clark Clifford said, David McCullough said, to some people, for the, it, it was just like a place on a map. Truman said, no, there's much more going on there. Truman, was, um, Truman met with the chief rabbi of Israel, Isaac Halevi Herzog, who called on him at the White House. And he looked Truman in the eyes. And he said, Mr. President, God put you in your mother's womb. So you would be the instrument to bring the rebirth of Israel after 2,000 years. David Niles said, you know, I thought the rabbi was overdoing things. <laughs> but when I looked over at the president, tears were running down his cheeks. Yeah. I mean, Truman, ever since Bible classes in Independence, Missouri in the early 1900s had been reading this stuff. Early on, Truman did worry about siding with Israel because it could involve possibly American troops facing hostile Arabs. I'll get, I'll get to that in a minute, a minute. And he was lobbied heavily by, um, by American Jews who, want, who wanted him to, of course, of course to, to support Israel. One of the people that lobbied him personally was Eddie Jacobson, who was his old uh, Independence, Missouri business partner. So Truman, after being a farmer, was a haberdasher, right? What's a haberdasher? Hats, Hat, hats right? Suits, right? And, and so Truman, after consistent lobbying from Eddie Jacobson, said to him, all right, Eddie, you win, you bald-headed SOB. I'll meet with him. I'll meet with him. So he met, <laughs> met, with, uh, met with Chaim Wiseman uh, as well. And Michael Medved talked about that meeting earlier. Now, as for what was going on in the Truman administration, I want to make sure that I represent this fairly because it also gives you an idea of what Truman was up against and also that Marshall and some of the other people you know, had a point to an extent for, for, their, for their position. George Marshall was the head of the State Department from this area. He's, George Marshall is a, is a Uniontown native, right? Uh, the Marshall Plan is named for, for George Marshall. So Marshall feared that um, if the Israeli state, if a Jewish state was created, this would lead to a broader Middle East war because the Arabs had promised, quote, we will push the Jews into the sea. We will push the Jews into the sea. What's the saying today from the river to the sea? Yeah, that's, that's nothing new, man, nothing new. And by the way, Marshall was right, 1201, AM, May 14, 1948, they came in to push the Jews to the sea. So he was worried that that, that 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 would happen. He was very worried about offending the Arabs, all right? Um, he also thought that Harry Truman was being uh, motivated by domestic politics, 
for the Jewish vote. Because Truman comes in in 1945, there's an election in 1948, right? By the way, so who does he, who does he run against in 1948? Tom Dewey. Tom Dewey, governor of New York. And they had done a, a, a famous poll, because they didn't have, really have, they didn't have reliable polling back then. I don't even know if there was Gallup yet. But they did a survey of the 50 top newspaper columnists in the country, predicting who they thought would win, would win the election. 50 out of 50 said Dewey. 50 out of 50. So the Chicago paper even went ahead and printed early, right? Dewey wins. And that picture of Harry Truman lifting up that paper with a big grin is, is just, just an, amaz an amazing thing to see. But uh, Marshall feared that supporting Israel against the Arabs could result in the Arabs cutting off America's Middle East oil supply. It's a legitimate fear. Um, although at that point, we still had a lot of domestic oil. Um, after we don't for a while, a few decades later, a lot of it coming from right here, the state of Pennsylvania. So that would hurt the U.S. not only economically, but it could also hurt us in a couple of other ways in 1948. The Marshall Plan. We had just approved the Marshall Plan, about 16 billion U.S. dollars, to, fight the, to stop the Soviets from going into Western Europe. We needed money at that time. Churchill came to Independence, Missouri in February 1946 and gave his Iron Curtain speech to try to alert the world that an Iron Curtain is descending across the continent and told Americans, Britain can't do this anymore. We tried to stop the Nazis first in 1940. We're totally rubble. So is France. Uh, somebody needs to stop the beast this time, and it needs to be the United States. So you know, we couldn't have a lack of Middle Eastern oil during that time. Exact same time, 1947, 48, 1949, the Berlin blockade, right, by, uh, by the Soviets in, in East Berlin, which led to the United States responding with the Berlin airlift. airlift, the Berlin airlift. This massive supply of U.S. planes flying daily into Berlin. Now, how are you going to do that without the oil? So, you know, Marshall, who was you know, chief of staff of the Army in World War II, it gets this stuff. He understands it. It's a good point. Truman, uh, so Marshall confronts Truman in a cabinet meeting. And he goes through this issue, and he's taking on Truman. And Truman was very deferential to, to Marshall. Um, Marshall had been called, uh, Harry Truman had called George Marshall, quote, the greatest living American. That's how much he respected him. I mean, he looked up to Marshall. Right, like Marshall was almost his, his, his superior. And in one of the cabinet meetings, somebody said to Truman, you know, Mr. President, uh, I hate to tell you this, but there are a lot of people that wish that Marshall was president instead of you. And he said, I wish that Marshall was president instead of, instead of me, right? He said, you know, but unfortunately, you're stuck with me. So, so, that, so that's just the way it is. So they, uh, and Truman had even said with, um, in regard to the Marshall Plan, he said, why do we call it the Marshall Plan instead of the Truman Plan? Because if it went to Congress with my name on it, it wouldn't have gotten approved. So that's how much Marshall was respected. So they go around the room, and they're talking about supporting the creation of the nation of Israel. Truman's all for it. And Marshall looks at him square in the eye, kind of a cabinet room setting, and says, Mr. President, if you do this, if you support the creation of this nation of Israel, and especially for these political purposes, that Marshall suspected he was doing it for. I would be forced not to support you in the next election. And Clark Clifford said, uh, man, you could, have, you could have heard a pin drop. And uh, Truman just kind of swallowed, and the meeting sort of ended. And Truman at the end said to Clifford, he said, man, that was tough as a cob, like a corn cob. And, uh, but, he, but he was able to sort of keep Marshall uh, on, on the reservation. Clifford said, in Clifford's words, Marshall spoke to Truman in, quote, a righteous, uh, g-damned <laughs> Baptist tone and said that Truman was subordinating an international problem to domestic politics and diminishing the dignity of the presidency. In response, James Forrestal, the newly created Secretary of Defense for the newly created Department of Defense, anyone know what happened to Forrestal? It's quite tragic. Um, committed suicide. Our first Secretary of Defense committed suicide. 
uh, bitterly denounced what he called the Jewish lobby. He told the president, no group in this country should be permitted to influence our policy to the point where it would endanger our national security. All right. So with, so with that, uh, Truman also was told by his newly created Joint Chiefs of Staff and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which had also been created in the June 1947 National Security Act, that if, if this happened and the U.S. had to get involved, because who had been there in Palestine up until 47, 48, as kind of occupying peacekeeper forces? England, the Brits. And man, they got out of Dodge in early May, right? They got out of there right away. So we're already considering, if we support an Israeli state, do we have an obligation to at least try to keep the peace? And the Joint Chiefs of Staff told Truman that that would require the presence of at least 100,000 US troops if we were to be there. The Arabs, Secretary Forrestal told President Truman, would, quote, push the Jews into the sea. All right, so the moment finally comes, and the vote at the UN and uh, Harry Truman's position came into the US delegation at the UN. This is David McCullough. While Truman's position was known and had been building, he finally switched permanently to, to supporting the nation of Israel, assuming it was ever a switch infuriating many in his administration, such as Marshall. His formal announcement of de facto U.S. recognition of the new state of Israel, coming in at 11 minutes after Israel became a new state at 6 p.m. Jerusalem time, flabbergasted the U.S. delegation at the U.N. Some American delegates actually broke out into laughter because they thought it was a joke. Ambassador Austin, who was told in advance and knew it was true, was so upset by his colleague's reaction that he just left without telling any of the others. So um, it was Truman. It was Truman, Truman, Truman alone who did this. You know, had FDR lived and had Marshall and Forrestal and the others, it's hard, it's hard to imagine Israel coming into being. I'll wrap up with... Um, just a, a, a few thoughts here from my friend Jason Maus, who's the editor of the Jewish Press. And he wrote this about Truman a few, a few years ago on the anniversary of his death. Harry Truman has long been considered a hero in a struggle for a Jewish state. The truth is somewhat more complicated. Certainly Truman deserves praise for two major decisions he made as president with regard to Israel. One of an affirmative U.S. vote in the United Nations for the partition of Palestine and two, immediate U.S. recognition of the new Jewish state. But the backstory to the headlines uh, tells a decidedly more ambiguous tale. The fact is, from the time he took, death, uh, uh, took office upon the death of Franklin Roosevelt in April 1945, Truman at first waffled on the Zionist cause. By the way, this was true with a lot of stuff Truman did. Truman wasn't the great anti-communist of history in 1945, 1946, when, when, uh, when, when Churchill came to Independence, Missouri and made that Iron Curtain speech, Truman was embarrassed by it. So Truman had to kind of evolve into this anti-communist president, just as he became this pro-Zionist, pro-Israel president. Truman was a curiously divided man, one capable of speaking in the most sympathetic, even lyrical terms of Jewish suffering and the rights of Jews to a homeland. And in the very next breath, referring to Jews with barnyard epithets and anti-Semitic invective. Now, I'm going through this because some people aware of, of some of Truman's comments uh, will point this out, like, yeah, this conflict, why did Truman say what he said in, in private? Jason Miles's answer is this, a product of his environment, Truman was raised in a late 19th century small town environment where outsiders were viewed with varying degrees of suspicion if not outright revulsion. I try to tell this to my students today, right? We, we, weren't, as, we weren't as ethnically sensitive, <laughs> right, folks, as we are today, right? Anybody with like, you know, an old grandfather, right? People from the early 1900s and everything, right? When people, people would use that ethnic language and I could give you a whole list of Truman's names for all the guys that he had under his command in World War I that he loved like sons, all right? And to go from my family's background, my dad's Polish, they were Polacks to Truman, all right? Uh, my mother's 100% Italian, Truman called them Dagos, all right? So you could, you could, but he loved them all, right? So a lot of times when you're reading these documents, 
they're speaking that way, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they, that they hate these, these individuals. But by the way, in FDR's case, the actions followed the bad language, all right? So, you know, F FDR, was, that was his true heart. The image, um, so Truman, it should come therefore as no surprise that in private conversations, Truman freely in term, uh, employed terms like, like hike. In a letter to his wife, he made disapproving mention of Miami's hotels, filling stations, Hebrews, and cabins, unquote. And here's a very telling anecdote of his environment that he came from. By the way, all of which I think shows even more positive what he did in 1948. Years after Truman left office, David Suskind was working with the former president on a television documentary. Do you remember uh, Suskind, right? Suskind said that each morning he would arrive at Truman's house in Independence, Missouri. So this is after the presidency. He would wait on the front porch on a cold February day while Mrs. Truman went in to inform her husband of his arrival. After about the fourth morning of this, Suskind asked the former president in his walk why he was never asked inside the house. You're a Jew, David, and no Jew has ever been in this house. A nonplus Suskind replied, I'm amazed, sir, that you who recognize Israel and champion the integration of the army, Truman did that too, and FDR did not, would say such a thing. David, he explained, this is not the White House. It's the Wallace House that was Bess, his wife, Bess Truman's family's house. By the way, Truman had the worst mother-in-law in the history of the pres presidential <laughs> politics. I mean, just a brutal woman. Bess runs it. And there's never been a Jew inside the house or in her mother's lifetime. Uh, but of course, it wasn't just his wife, writes David Maus, as, as President Truman was, was, would complain about Jews. At a cabinet meeting in 1946, he angrily remarked, if Jesus Christ couldn't satisfy them here on earth, how the hell am I supposed to? <laughs> Following one particular tense meeting with Zionist leaders, by the way, remember again, his business partner, Eddie Jacobson, was a Jew. Right? Long before that. Truman snapped, I'm not a New Yorker. All these people are pleading for a special interest. I'm an American. And yet, when, when Marshall accuses him of pleading for special interests, um, he doesn't plead for special interests. He does the right thing. Uh, so other examples. I could give other examples, but Jason Mao sums up with this. And yet, here's the other side to Harry Truman. The side history remembers as the president who stood up to enormous anti-Zionist pressure from within his own administration, and despite maybe ambivalent personal feelings about Jews, and even vacillation over the issue of Palestine, he came down on the side of a Jewish state when it counted the most. My friend Ben Stein, um, who's been writing for us at American Spectator since 1972, he's in the movie um, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, right? Bueller, Bueller, anyone, anyone? Um, Ben's hero is Richard Nixon, who in 1973 saved the nation of Israel. And you could read statements like that from Nixon, too. Right? But Jason Mao's point is, whatever he might have said in private, um, there was no better friend for the nation of Israel in 1948 than, than uh, Harry Truman. All right, so I'll stop there. I'll take any questions that you have. Thank you very much. <laughs> David Weiss, yes. to you. Mike. Oh, yeah, Salzburger, the New York Times. Whew. Yeah, I could repeat it. He's I was asking about uh, Salzburger, who was the uh, owner of the New York Times. Terrible. Back, back in the, in, during World War II, and how he covered up a lot of the nonsense that was going on with the Holocaust. Right. Yeah, Salzburg and the New York Times were terrible. Um, our friend Mark Levin talks about that a lot. I mean, Levin um, wrote about it in his books, and I bet uh, Mark complains about it probably once a, once a week. I don't mean that in a negative way, Mark. He's right on, right? Um, but it, it's so aggravating. It's so infuriating. It's really horrific what the New York Times did. Yeah, pro I, I can't speak to it, but um, yeah, I can't speak to his relationship with Salzburg. But there's no quote about how bad the times was. Terrible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think uh, FDR saw in Truman that 
room and that he picked him as a uh, vice president. I'll tell you, uh, if you want to make a case for providential intervention in presidential history, uh, it, it, uh, FDR picking Truman was just, just, uh, it was just, just such a blessing because I could give a half hour talk on this right now. Uh, there's a new book out now on Henry Wallace. Henry Wallace is previous vice president, pro-Soviet, pro-Stalin, just, um, Brad, you know this history. Uh, Henry Wallace was, was just terrible. In 1948, he ran against Truman for president of the United States on the Progressive Party ticket, which was completely run by the Communist Party. And, and so Wallace was far and away like the American Communist pick. He himself wasn't a member of the party, um, but he was, he was pro-Soviet. And, and uh, the world would have been completely different, completely different. If, uh, if, if FDR had not dropped Wallace for Truman, under pressure from others, by the way. One of the worst picks that, that, that he made. All right, we got time for one more. It's yeah. 45. Brad. When did the Jews start voting for the Democrat Party? And that's a good question, right? Uh, I, don't, I don't know that history well enough. Uh, but to quote Ben Stein, um, so. He, he, he asked, yeah, there, Michael Medved, go. The first election where the Democratic candidate for president got the majority of the Jewish vote was 1928. FDR. And it was no. partially because Al Smith, the governor of New York, who had been a great friend of the Jewish community, was running for president and faced vicious anti-Catholic propaganda. He's running against Herbert Hoover. And up until that time, uh, Jews had split their votes in 1924 because Coolidge was popular among Jews. T.R., Teddy Roosevelt, uh, won overwhelming majorities of Jewish voters in New York. So they believed the very first time there was a decisive Jewish majority for Democrats was 1928 uh, during, with Al Smith versus Herbert Hoover. And uh, ever since then, it's partially demographic. It's because of where Jews in America were located. It used to be that the majority of the Jewish community would be in the tri-state New York, New Jersey, Connecticut area. And it's not that way anymore. It, it just isn't. And by the way, Tel Aviv is, does now have a bigger Jewish population, the even than New, New York City. OK. All right. That's good. That's good. That's good. Took a little while to get there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the uh, Ben Stein notes that uh, Michael could confirm this. I think Jews voted against Nixon two to one in 1972, voted for McGovern, and um, but boy were they lucky that Nixon won, because uh, I thought about doing a whole talk. Uh, in fact, I had asked Ben Stein to come to this conference just a bit. He's not in good health. Um, to I had asked him to come just to speak on. Nixon is hero. He just wrote a book on Nixon. And the, and the 50th anniversary of that war was um, October 6, 2023. So the, the 50th anniversary almost to the day that they attacked on, that Hamas attacked on October 7th. But yeah, so I think, Michael, I think the shift really began in the FDR years, as it did for black Americans who had voted Republican since Lincoln. So I mean, FDR, it's just, it's just so aggravating. I mean, to, to, you know, it really is, isn't it? To know the way that the guy felt and talked and the things that he said, and he just kind of cleans up politically. And, and to this day, he's like an icon, a hero, an untouchable. If the liberals had a Mount Rushmore, he'd be the first head they'd chisel up there. You know, right next to Margaret Sanger, probably. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question with, uh, with, with Eleanor. Um, I, I don't know. I can't speak to that. But um, I don't know. I wouldn't hazard a guess. I don't know for sure. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, you put the Truman, you mentioned about the arms, arms embargo. The United States, you don't need uh, embargo of arms. It's not with Paris, right? Yeah, and I mean, we really didn't start providing arms to Israel until um, after the Six Day War, June 1967. I mean, that's really where everything changes. Abba Iban visits uh, the White House, meets with LBJ. And, uh, and in fact, informed LBJ that we were thinking that, that, that Israel was thinking of doing a preemptive strike because they were completely surrounded, even worse than in 1948. 
and uh, LBJ McNamara sat down with Abe Ibon. And by the way, if only McNamara could have had this good uh, forecast on the Vietnam War. He told him, he said, um, he, he said, LBJ said, if you preempt, we can't support you. If you're attacked, we, we can support you. And LBJ, uh, McNamara told, told him, told Ibon, if you guys preempt, you'll win this war in a week, six day war. If not, it'll take 10 to 14 days, but you'll have much higher casualties. LBJ said, you'll lick them. The kind of typical LBJ talk. So, uh, so but they preempted and they won uh, six days of six day war. And then after that, that's when the U, after that, I think every prime minister of, of Israel after that point visits the White House. Prior to that, I don't know that any had up to that point. And, uh, and then we were, and because of that, we know Nixon was there for him in 1973. Now you, should, you should see some of the Nixon statements, yelling at James Schlesinger as Secretary of Defense, yelling at Kissinger, um, you, know, you know, get those arms over there, damn it, you know, get them on the plane, now, 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 swearing, cussing, uh, you, know, you know, what's going on, you know, send Israel whatever they want, now, whatever they want. I think Golda Meir said that something to the fact Nixon will always be my president. And she was uh, not exactly a right winger. But, uh, but he and Truman, if you're looking back historically, I'd say those two presidents were probably the best friend that Israel ever had. Uh, and as much as jo Donald Trump is maligned, um, you know, Donald Trump was just great on Israel and even you know, moved the US embassy, which so many said that they were gonna do and they never did. Uh, Donald Trump is our only president with Jewish grandchildren, for, for, for that matter. And, um, and he's not going to win a majority of the Jewish vote either. Uh, but but uh, I don't know. David, we think he might do okay, though. We think he might do probably better than, yeah, but he's not going to win a majority. Right. Yeah. Yeah, if Trump, if Trump would get even several percentage points in each of those categories, which he seems to be doing with black Americans, um, then that, I think, explains one of the reasons why he's been up in the polls since October. But that's a whole other issue. <laughs> Dr. Kangor, we're, we're at time. All right, Isaacs. Yeah, sounds good. All right, thanks so much.